Let us pray. Lord, right now we would just want to say, we just want to be with you. We're in the heavens. Meet with us, Lord. Lord, you have, I acknowledge that you have met with me since the start of this service. And I pray that's been true for so many others today. But if anyone still has not met with you, would you right now speak to them? Would they know of your presence, your love, and your grace? I pray that you would take your living and active word, the word of you, holy God, and take the reading of it and the preaching of it and speak to hearts today. May everyone here be able to leave today saying, I have met with the Lord. He has met with me. He has spoken through his word. He has guided. He has pierced my heart. Lord God, help us to be honest in assessing ourselves today with where we are spiritually. If there's sin to confess, lead us to confess it. If there's promises from your word to claim, lead us to pro- claim them. If there's truths we need to believe, lead us to believe them. May you be pleased and honored in this place. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Nehemiah, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2. As you're doing so, you've already heard today that I'm going to be in Guatemala next Sunday. And so typically when everyone knows the preacher is out, they start wondering, well, who is preaching? So my father-in-law, Joe Turner, Dr. Joe Turner, pastor of Redemption Church in Hernando, Mississippi, is going to be here next Sunday to preach God's Word. Now what I'm about to say I have to say it very carefully. If you think I'm a great preacher, there's reason to come next Sunday when I'm out. There was this one preacher that uh, he, wouldn't, he wasn't able to be there, and his brother got up to preach in his stead, and as soon as he did, half the people left. And as they were walking out, the, the brother said, oh, by the way, if you're here to worship, and he named his brother then you can continue and walk on out right now. But if you're here to worship the Lord, you can sit down. Woo, it got quiet in that place real quick. And so sometimes when people hear that the pastor's out, they say, well, I'll just take this Sunday off. Don't do that. God speaks through me. I believe that. But God does not limit his speaking through me. It is through his word and his messengers. And there will be a messenger with a word from God here next Sunday. And I encourage you to be here, and I encourage you to invite others to be here to be fed God's truth next Sunday. The title of the message today, Take Care of What God Has Blessed You With. Take care of what God has blessed you with. In In Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, it's around 444 or so B.C., Nehemiah, as the book begins, is living in the city, capital city of Susa. It's the capital of the Persian Empire. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles east of Jerusalem. And so people had been to Jerusalem, and they come back to Susa, and he goes up to them asking them how it is going over in Jerusalem because he, he's interested in his own people, the Jewish people. And Jerusalem is God's city. And so He asks the condition, and he finds out that the people there are under great distress, and they're a reproach, and the wall around the city and the gates are not in good shape. If you'll look with me in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, and I'll read the primary text in just a moment, but 
for the moment right now, if you'll look there with me, he says in the end of verse 2, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there is in the province who survived the captivity and they are in great distress and reproach. And all the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. In 586 BC, the city of Jerusalem was basically, it was ransacked, it was destroyed. The temple destroyed, the city destroyed, all of that. Then you had the 70 years called of captivity. You read the book of Daniel. Daniel was in Babylon taken at the beginning of that captivity in 605. And in 535, they were able to return. The Persians conquered the Babylonians and the Jews were able to return to the the city of Jerusalem. Well, about 50,000 from Babylon returned to Jerusalem. At that time, they started rebuilding the temple, but then came great opposition and they got shut down. Well, they put it off and had not returned to building it. And we learn in the book of Haggai that they had built their paneled houses, but they had neglected the temple for about 16 years at that time. They had not gotten back to rebuilding God's house. Now we jump from around 516 at the time of Haggai where the temple is, they start rebuilding the temple and it is rebuilt as we read in that book. And now it's 444, 445 B.C. Another 70 years or so. And Nehemiah wants to know how the people are doing and how the wall is doing. And they tell him the wall is still not repaired. And the people are in great distress. What a sad testimony. This grieves Nehemiah. Look in verse 4 of chapter 1. He says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah wept over the condition of a physical structure. And it wasn't even the temple. It was a wall around God's city. He wept over the condition of the people because when it says that they're in great distress, it means they're not living in victory in the Lord. It means they're living discouraged and defeated lives. That the testimony of the great Lord is not being proclaimed. That the pagan people are not seeing that the God of the Jews is the one true God. But that God's people are living in distress. And it grieves Nehemiah and he weeps over it and he fasts. And and then he hears the condition of the wall and that adds to it. And he weeps over the condition of a wall. Why? Because that wall is a testimony of the Lord. And the unfinished wall brought a reproach on the people and it brought a terrible testimony toward the Lord. And so he was grieved over it and he wept for days because the name of the Lord was not in high regard in Jerusalem. In chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, we find Nehemiah begins to pray. And and in the prayer, he confesses the sins of the people. Catch that. Because a physical structure was not redone and upgraded and restored, the people reflected their sinfulness. How we take care of stuff is a reflection of our spiritual walk with the Lord. By hearing that the wall was not repaired and restored, Nehemiah knew that the people were not right with God. What a, that's a strong statement. And in verses 5 through 11, he confesses sin for, on their behalf as he is fasting. Over the years, the people back in Jerusalem had gotten comfortable. They had lost sight of what should be. The wall should have been restored Now, as we continue in the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 2, Nehemiah goes before the king, and Nehemiah's a cupbearer, which in simple forms means that he tries everything the king is about to drink to make sure it's not poison, okay? And so, Nehemiah was, was, was able to be in the presence of the king on a regular basis, and he goes to the king after prayer, and he asks permission to leave Susa, travel hundreds of miles back to Jerusalem to examine that wall and lead the people to restore it. 
The Lord prompted him to do that. And so he asked that permission. He also needs not only for the king to approve his trip, which means he's not going to be there by the king. You got to realize a king trusts his cupbearer. Okay? You don't just bring in anybody. Okay? And he's now, his cupbearer is now asking to leave and leave for years before he'll return. But the king grants it. Why? Because God was in it. And then Nehemiah needs the paperwork. He's going to go through province after province after province. And all those people are going to stop him and say, what right do you have to be here? And he needs to pull out the paperwork. And, he, and the king granted it. So he was able to unscroll the scroll and say, here's the king giving me permission to be here. Very well. Continue on. In addition, he spoke with a man by the name of Asaph where he would get all the lumber he needed to rebuild the gates that were torn down and burned down there in Jerusalem. So as he's traveling to Jerusalem, he, is, he has made the arrangements to have all the supplies he needs for the gates to be rebuilt. And Asaph gives him all the lumber he needs. Why? Because the Lord was in it. So now we're going to pick up the story when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. If you're slightly interested, if you'll say amen. 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 If you're greatly interested, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you'll join me in standing for the reading of God's Word, I'm going to read verses 11 through 18 of chapter 2. Nehemiah writes, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting in my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which was broken down and its gates which were consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in? That Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we would no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. It's the word of the living God. God bless you. You may be seated. Number one, assess the situation. Each of us need to do this in our own lives. We need to assess the situation we are in. According to verses 11 through 15, three days after Nehemiah arrived, he began to assess the situation of the wall around Jerusalem. See, when Nehemiah arrived, he didn't just go around saying, you dumb people, how could you not rebuild God's wall? He didn't do that. He took his time, and on the third day, he evaluated the wall. Nehemiah knew the wall was severely damaged, but, and he knew he was led there by God to restore it, but he didn't know how severe. He didn't know how long it would take, how many people it would take, how many sections were totally demolished, how many sections just needed a little bit of repair. So he has to evaluate and assess the situation regarding the wall. Why? Because again, the people had lost sight of what should be. We learned that this situation that yes, God cares about souls first and foremost. He cares about people. Jesus died for people, not for things. But we also learn, and we learn from this text that God cares about us being good stewards of what God has blessed us with. God had given the city of Jerusalem, he had given the temple, had given the wall, and he wanted them to testify of him. The people in Jerusalem were to take care of these things. 
and they had not taken care of the wall. It was bringing a reproach on the people and a poor testimony to the Lord. God cares about physical structures. And so good leaders assess the situation. You here in this room that own your own business or manage people, you're assessing the situation in your workplace. At least if you want to be successful, you are. Each of us are to assess the situation. Every coach is assessing the talent, abilities, and, and who's best in what positions on their ball team. Anytime we got to work together, the leaders got to assess the situation. In your homes, we just did the series on marriage and family. I hope that you have assessed your marriage. I hope you have assessed what you're doing with your children. And are you fulfilling all that God wants you to fulfill in their lives? Are you discipling your children? Have you assessed your own spiritual well-being? Have you assessed your spiritual life? Is the only time you're being fed the Word of God is on a Sunday when it's taught and preached? Or are you opening it and letting God feed you day by day? When you open it and read it, are you meeting with God or are you going through the routine? Are you meditating upon the Proverbs we're reading? Take one or two a day and really let it sink in where you carry it with you and you're thinking about it throughout the day. Are you letting the Word of God guide your life? You need to assess your situation. You also need to assess, are you a good steward of the assets God's provided for you? It is not a great testimony of the Lord to be a slob with your home. It's a reflection on him. It is not a good steward of the property God's provided for you to not keep up with it. Now, there are different standards to this. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. There are some that pay a, a, a bit of money and they make sure there's not a weed on their lawn. And good for you. If any of you want to send that stuff my way, send it. But I, I don't put that in my budget right now. But I'm still responsible that my lawn doesn't get three feet high to where everyone in the community is talking about, hey, that guy down there won't take care of his yard. It's a poor testimony of Christ because they're complaining about, they would be complaining about my lawn, okay? So there's got to be some level of upkeep of the assets and the, the property and the home and the, and the, the vehicle that God has blessed you with. All right, that doesn't win anyone to Jesus, but it sure can keep them from listening to you talk about Jesus. Okay, and so we are to be good stewards. Here at the church, we are to be good stewards of the, the facilities and the property God has given to us. It is a reflection of him. Number two, reveal the issue. Nehemiah assessed the situation of the wall. Now he's going to reveal the issue. In verses 12 through 15, that's where he journeyed around the wall, examining and inspecting every part of it, getting a game plan of what needs to happen. He knew he needed to rebuild the wall, but now he knows step by step how it needs to take place. And so in verses 16 and 17, he, he begins to reveal the issue. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I'd done. Nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, and here's where he reveals it. You see the bad situation we are in? That Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire? And the short answer is no, they had not seen the situation. He saw it. He brings forth a motion for action. He's now speaking to the Jews, the officials, the priests, all these people, all the leading people of Jerusalem, and he's basically presenting the motion. Do y'all not see what needs to take place here? We've got to get busy. We've got to build up the city by restoring the wall and its gates. Do you not see the situation we're in? He, he's making a motion, so to speak. He's leading them to see what they don't see. When I went to pastor, uh, as senior pastor, my first church in Arkansas, it was a wonderful ministry there that Tiffany and I were able to enjoy. And 
when we came in view of a call, the church building was about 100 yards from the road. And about 30 yards from the road was a dirt pile right in front of the church. It was about seven feet high, maybe 20 feet in diameter. And we thought that's kind of odd that that dirt mound's there, but uh, I'm sure they'll be taking care of it soon. But uh, they might want to have taken care of it before the new pastor saw it. But it's okay. I'm not here to deal with a dirt mound, so to speak. I'm here to love and lead and feed the people. God called us there, and, and I, I was pastoring there, and about four months to eight months in, it's all kind of vague to me now, but someone visiting for like the second or third week and said, Pastor, what's going on with the dirt mound out front? I said, well, what are you implying? Well, are y'all going to ever move it? And I said, I'll get it done. I had come in and been there months. And you know how important it became to me? Not at all. Because I passed it day after day and just got to where I didn't even notice it. But the people driving down the highway, seeing the church building, they saw it all the time. And probably people in the community were saying, do they not care enough about their property to get that dirt mound moved? If a visitor's asking that, then some in the community are probably asking that. So what happened? We got it taken care of. What's the point? Sometimes when you pass things all the time, you don't notice what new eyes see. Some of the most valuable testimonies we receive here at this church is from people visiting and deciding to join. Because we get to ask them multiple things. When they're joining, what brought you here? We know the Holy Spirit is at work, and he brought you here, but did someone personally invite you? Do you have a student that uh, went to a, a youth activity or a children's activity or a preschool activity, or did you come to uh, gospel singing or a senior adult gathering? What, what connection? Do you know a member here that invited you, or did you just see the building? I mean, what, what, how did you find out about us? What brought you here? And learning that information is valuable. And then we can ask them, is there anything we can do better to make it uh, more fluent and efficient and helpful for people considering Millington First Baptist Church? That's a helpful question that people that have been here for 20 years won't be able to answer near as effectively. I've been here now two years. I can't answer it near as effectively as the one that's new they see what we don't see. And they could say, well, you can improve the, the connectors, you can improve the greeters, you can improve the nursery ministry impression, you can improve the children. Uh, they could name anything and everything. They also could brag on anything and everything. But you want to know? They might say, well, we visited a life group and the teacher didn't look like they had prepared. Or when we first came in the building, we came in and we stood there for 20 seconds and no one said a word to us. And we were wanting that some direction on where to go. We didn't know what to do and no one said anything to us. That type of stuff irks me. Okay? We don't want that to ever happen. Okay? Or maybe they'll say, well, they'll say it to another person and not me. Uh, we thought the preaching was pretty pitiful. We don't get it that bluntly, but you know, that can, that can happen. And then I need, to, I need to know that. I need to be able to go speak to them and say, um, I heard that you weren't real pleased and satisfied with the preaching. How can I be better at ministering to you? Or maybe the music, they can brag on the music or they can say, we didn't sing enough or we sang too long or there's too many new songs or too many old songs. There's a whole lot of stuff going on when you ask people's opinion, don't you? You can find out a whole lot. But all of that is valuable because they also might say, a portion of the, I was walking up the stairs and it didn't look clean in that stairwell. You can learn a whole lot from prospects, from visitors, from new members. And we value, if you're a visitor, you're a prospect, you're a new member, we value your, your input 
and we will take it to the Lord in prayer because we want to be faithful to the Lord and do everything with excellence because God cares about it. That's what we're learning from the, if he cares about a wall, he cares about how well we're ministering to people. Can I get an amen to that? He cares a lot about it. And so we want to be a place where you are welcomed and loved and and you're taken to where you need to be taken. You're shown what you need to see. And we care about you from the beginning of getting on the property to when you leave the property on a given day. We want you to be fed through the preaching of the word where you can leave saying the preaching was Bible anchored. It was anchored to what God says. We want music to be worshipful. And not entertaining, but worshipful, where we encounter the living God through the worship of song. We want the fellowship to be sweet, where the unity of the Spirit is preserved here among the family of God. We want to be effective ministers of the truth of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Nehemiah was new to town, and he saw what the others didn't see. Number three now, he assessed the situation, he revealed the issue, and now number three, he's going to call the people to action. Verse 17, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. Now, to us reading this, the wall's been damaged and it's been this way for over a hundred years now. And so it would seem obvious to us, they need to get busy rebuilding the wall. But as time passes and you don't do it, you become accustomed to it. And they didn't realize the need anymore. They would walk past a damaged wall and a burned down gate and think nothing of it anymore. And now he's drawing their attention back to it. Let's rebuild so that what? We will no longer be a reproach. Now church, this is important for us to get. What was it making them a reproach? What does that mean? It means it was, it was making people look down on them rather than admire them and their God. And they were a reproach not because the, they had a reputation of committing indecent acts. They were a reproach simply because they did not build a wall. because they did not do a basic thing they knew that they should have done. And it was a terrible testimony on the one true God. The other people that were non-Jews, when they looked at the Jews, they didn't say, man, they are a great worshipful people. And their God, his hand of favor is upon them. I wanna be like them, I wanna know their God. No one was saying that because they can't even rebuild a wall. Are y'all with me? All right. So. The wall was a poor testimony on them and the Lord, and God used Nehemiah to recognize the issue and reveal it to them. And so now he's calling them to action. We must realize that we can be a reproach on others by not being good stewards of our property, as, in, as families and individuals, our homes, our apartments, our vehicles. We're not good stewards of God's facilities here, the building and the grounds. All of these are testimonies. They are an extension and a reflection of the glory of the Lord and his greatness. Are you being a good steward of what God has blessed you with? And we must ask, and I as as your leader must ask, are we here at Millington First Baptist being good stewards of what God has blessed us with? Let us never be a reproach to our community. As we've addressed and assessed our situation in the previous weeks, we've been assessing family and marriage. Last week, we assessed time. Are you being a good steward of the time that God has given to you? Or are you wasting it away? Remember, you can't put time on layaway. You can't save it. You can't store it. You use it or lose it. As Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, how 
Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. I want you to take a moment before I continue preaching. Close your eyes, bow your heads, and assess where you are. Assess where you are spiritually. Are you apathetic toward the Lord? Are you indifferent? Are you on fire? Do you feel weak or strong? Are you surrendered or trying to convince God your way is better? Assess your spiritual condition and be honest. And if you need to confess sin, confess sin. Assess whether you've been a good steward of what he's blessed you with. We are not to worship things and stuff. Things are never to be more important than people, but God does care about how well we take care of what he's blessed us with. If you need to confess sin, confess sin. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you've blessed us with. We thank you for our families, our friends, our resources our homes, apartments, jobs, assets. Lord, we say thank you. Help us to honor you with what you've blessed us with. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Two weeks from today on November 13th, we'll receive our harvest offering. For you who are visiting with us, this is an offering that's received here at the church year after year after year. For many years, it went to pay for this building, this beautiful building and this property. Now that is paid off. In the last few years, the offering has gone to repaving the parking lot. And last year, it went to the beautiful playground we out, have outside at the end of the children's wing. And by the way, the permanent fence will go up in about a month for that beginning of December. So that's what the offering went to last year. So I want to make you aware of what the offering is going to go to this year as we receive this offering. Two weeks from today, we encourage you on that day to give faithfully to the Lord's work, the budget work, the ministry of the church, but also give above and beyond two weeks from today to these causes. There's five items. I did four. There's five. There's five items that uh, we're going to be giving to this year, and it covers the different age groups in the church as we meet these needs. First, we want a sensory room. What is a sensory room? A sensory room for our preschool, that we go in our preschool ministry for preschool and children age. We have a great ministry uh, to those that are adults in this group of people. Uh, our STARS group is our adult group. We want to be most effective in ministering to any needs we have, special needs are sometimes referred to, for our children and preschoolers. Church, God loves everybody, he's for all people, and therefore we want to be a church that doesn't say no, if your child has a disability or special need, this is not the place for them, we wanna say this is the place for them. And so this sensory room will be just a few thousand dollars, but it is very helpful for those little ones with those opportunities, challenges, whichever word you want to use. We want to minister to those families and allow those parents to get just a small break to come in here and worship and know their children are well taken care of. Second, we want to expand our children's worship area. Since COVID happened, they got moved to the youth area now uh, the social distancing is not uh, called for anymore as it was in the past, um, but the numbers have increased. And so we want to be able to have them move back to the first floor, be in the children's worship area, but we want to expand that. We want to upgrade it. We want to remodel it. It will be 
we're talking roughly $10,000 for that, okay? And so we want to meet that need and have more space in our children's worship area. So we've addressed preschoolers and children and then children. This third one is that we have no restrooms and no entrance into the building where you, a handicapped person can push a handicap button and the door will swing open for them. We have no restrooms where they can open a restroom door by pushing a button and it swings open. We have handicap accessible stalls but not entrances. And we believe that we need to better accommodate those that are handicapped, all right? And so that will be fifty-five to $60,000 to make the main uh, restrooms on the first floor, and I think also there might be a, one on the second floor as well, uh, that will be made handicap accessible, all right? And so uh, that's, that's the third item. So now we've addressed a need that is for all ages, but obviously, uh, senior adults, some of them would fall into that handicap need and be a blessing to that age group. Then in the student ministry area, we want to upgrade the furniture in that area. It has been in there many years. It is worn out. So three to $4,000, we go toward uh, re, um, replacing the furniture in the youth hangout uh, section of that area. And it might be in the big rooms too, the worship rooms as well. And the last one is the, the big expense item. And the last one will only be done after the first four are funded and taken care of. Because this last one, I want to be honest with you, we could put it off for a year. We could put it off for two. It's not a necessity at the moment. But here, me, if we were $500,000 behind budget, I wouldn't be bringing this up. But as you saw, we have given hundreds of thousands of, dollars, of thousands of dollars to missions. We are not neglecting our call to reach the world for Christ. And in this offering in the past, it's gone to the building, it's gone to parking lot, it's gone to facilities and grounds. And so to continue with that, I believe we ought to remodel our front foyer. Our front foyer here, it'd be a couple hundred thousand dollars to get that done. All right, to do it well. Our columns out in the front foyer, people kick and trip on the corners of them. We would like to make that more, um, less of a target for us to bump into. Um, for lack of a better way to say it, we want to get new furniture. We want to tear away wallpaper and paint. We want to upgrade. Now, as we do this, we've got hundreds of opinions on what that ought to look like. I do not want to engage in any conversation about that. I'll just go ahead and tell you what I would like to see. Is it not look like my den? That it does not look like my home? But it looks more modern so that 15 years from now it still looks good for that time. I don't want, I don't want to redo it and do it again in five years. We want to redo it again in 20. We've been in the building for basically 19 years now. And it would be great if it was 19 more before we upgraded again and improved it, okay? And so, but we want a great first impression for our community and for the people that enter this building. There are some times when there's wedding receptions and even small weddings can happen right there in our front foyer. I also want to see our connect desk that's off to the side. I want to see that you still for us to go sign up for meals and, and events, but I want something smack right in the middle really that helps us engage a visitor. Amen. Where they don't have to walk in, it's right there. And there's people there to help them. So we really need the connect desk, but another one. Well, all of that costs money, okay? And so that's what the five items are. Again, the re remodel of the four year will get to that as long as we have the funds. We're gonna take care of those first four with the initial funds which I believe there's really no argument that those would be a blessing. The sensory room, expanding the children's worship, the youth furniture, and making our, our restrooms handicap accessible here, at least on the first floor. And again, I think there's one that will be on the second floor as well. So now you know what you're giving to uh, in two weeks. If we are able to take care of all those things, there are other things from, from uh, baseboards, to stair bumpers, to painting handrails. There's always gonna be upkeep uh, on the building. And once you have a building that's 19 years old, you start to need those things and things replaced and things. This last year we replaced some air conditioning units and so there's always gonna be some of that. So just know that that's happening 
And if we go beyond the needs, we'll, we'll start painting handrails and doing baseboards and things around that, around the facility here. Likely next year's harvest offering will have to help with some of these needs as well. Um, beyond the ones I mentioned, the five I mentioned. But I want you to hear my heart. I, I would like down the road, and it might be two years, it might be four, I don't know how long, but I'd like for more of this harvest offering to go to winning people directly. Um, we have the missions offering that a lot of that is helping missionaries and it's going outside our local area. I would like the harvest offering to get to where we're helping ministries locally and we're engaging the lost, we're helping people out of uh, difficult situations with those funds and getting them on the road to discipleship and deliverance from financial bondage or whatever the case may be. Uh, and so just know my heart is to help more directly with ministry. But this year it will go to these items and so I hope this will come ready in two weeks to give. So Nehemiah assessed the situation he revealed the issue of the wall. He called the people to action. And now we learn number four and final, what they did, take action. Verse eight, I, and that's Nehemiah here, told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words, which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. And they put their hands to the good work. Nehemiah revealed some things that needed to be done, right? And the people said, let's get it done. And I'm asking you today to join me. Let's get these things done. Let's get them done for the glory of God. Let's get them done because we need to be good stewards of the building and facilities that God's blessed us with. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm asking you to stay with me here. Are you right with God spiritually? Is there any sin you need to confess? Assess your spiritual condition. And then ask God what he wants you to sacrificially give. Not leftover money, but sacrificially give two weeks from today. That we together join as the church family to meet these needs. Let's be reminded, God cares about a wall, therefore he cares about the physical building. He cares about this property. He cares about the testimony we present through it. I ask that you give faithfully and sacrificially. You can give one time in two weeks, a large amount, one time, or you, you can give a portion and then give weekly or monthly throughout the year if you wish. But no, to get the first four needs done, we need, we need a good amount two weeks from today. I'm now gonna ask as you evaluate your spiritual condition, do you know that you're saved? Do you know the Lord and does the Lord know you by name? Has he saved you? Has he forgiven you? Does God the Spirit live within you? If you can't answer with a clear yes, then you can ask God to save you right now. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Will you call on him? Will you confess him as your Lord? Will you surrender your life to him and allow him to save you, to rescue you from the judgment you deserve, to forgive you and to make you his child. Right now, will you place your faith in him and receive him as your Lord and Savior? Holy Spirit, save the lost and stir the saved to give to be a good steward of the finances you have provided for us by giving to your work in two weeks to this special project, the harvest offering. May you be honored with our hearts as we worship you through giving today and every week and as we worship you through our giving two weeks from today. But Lord, I'm burdened for those that may not know you. Would you show that the, them that they don't know you? And would you lead them to repentance and faith, to trust in you? 
Save them, O Lord. Save them now, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.